Um, presumably, you can all see my screen right now. Yes, so yeah, I'll yeah. hop into it. We're going to talk about brand storytelling today. Um, like Colleen said, I'm the director of brand and experience here. Um, my focus is on stories and storytelling. So this is a great opportunity to, for me to meet you guys, meet our customers, and uh, get to know you in the community. A little bit about who I am. I'm a story addict, so I'm always listening to a podcast or an audio book. Um, I wish I could say I was good at music or listen to music, but I don't really. And I went to Egypt and Morocco for my honeymoon while six months pregnant. So I was less worried about the camels and more about Hefe. Um, also, I have the cutest toddler in the world. His name is Hart. He's two and a half years old. And my husband just called me saying he may be fake sick this morning and stayed home from daycare. So he's already learning the value of story. Um, I like to start with a quote. Ira Glass says that great stories happen to those who can tell them. Stories happen to all of us. So it's all in how we frame the narrative that either compels people or it bores them. This American Life, which Ira Glass hosts, they started with the mode of something like about a show about nobody who's famous, nothing you've ever heard of, nothing in the news. So their stories are about people who aren't journalists, who aren't professional storytellers. They just frame the story in the right way. They've, they've changed the, the whole landscape for journalistic radio. Um, so today we're going to talk about storytelling specifically the importance of stories, story elements, story structure, and I'm going to leave you with a framework you can use if works for you. Um, first, I want to start with a story. So this rock, when I was about nine years old, my parents said, we're going on a trip. And I was excited. We'd driven all across Canada. We'd driven to Alaska and I was pumped to go on another vacation. Um, they said, we're going to go see your grandparents in Texas, and you can eat all the grapefruit, play all the shuffleboard that you can handle. Um, and so this sounded great to me. And then they said, and we're going to fly. And I'd never been on a plane before, and I was devastated. I was terrified. I was certain that we would be going down. So um, after trying to convince my parents that we should drive the 30 or 40 hours instead of flying, um, and not being successful, I was resigned to the fact that we were going on a plane and I was pretty certain I wouldn't be coming home. So fairly morbid for a nine-year-old, but I left some sticky notes, you know, Laura, you can have my pog collection. Um, Kara, you can have my, my skater shoes. My friends can divide up my closet and the brothers who could, weren't coming with me could, could take the, my bike, um, all the important belongings for a kid. So then we boarded the plane and it was a small propeller plane. And of course we're sitting next to the engine. So it was loud. Like it might even be scary to me now after traveling for many years and I was nervous and I head down and I was definitely crying. And then we took off and we were fine and the flight was fine. And it was actually a little bit magical. Um, but when we got there and we got off the tarmac, I, the first thing I did was I was so grateful to be on the ground again as I picked up this rock. And I've taken this with me now. I've traveled a lot for work and for personal life, and I take it with me everywhere I go. It's a bit of a talisman. So what do you think this rock is worth to me? If you want to type something in the chat. Four dollars. Four dollars. I would say even more, right? This is something it's important to me. It's something that matters. But now I'm going to actually tell you the true story about this rock. This rock, um, my aunt was the first female researcher allowed into Area 51. She's a geologist. And on one of her last trips back, she snuck this out of there. And it's since been tested and has elements that prove not only is there life on other planets, but we've interacted with it. Now, what do you think this rock is worth? Yeah, I can't see invaluable. The it's invaluable, right? Um, true story is I picked this rock up on my way to work because I wanted to do the <laughs> shtick here. So the point is that the rock didn't change, but the value did and who it's valuable to did as well. So before you guys wouldn't have cared about the rock. It was my story. It was important to me. Um, but then if it was going to prove something as monumental as life on other planets, that's important to a lot of people. That's worth a lot. So most things have almost no inherent value. They only have the value that we assign to them. That's why the best story wins, not necessarily the best product or solution, but the best story, the brands that tell the best story. 
That's why it's so important for us to tell our stories and create this culture of storytelling within our organizations. Think like a diamond ring wasn't the engagement ring of choice into De Beers, until De Beers made it that way, right? The price of diamonds was falling all around the world. Then they had the control of the supply and demand and they framed it, a diamond is forever. Now, if you get engaged, it's unusual to get something, uh, a different diamond or even just not to have a ring. Um, so a few numbers that show us that stories are important. Stories are 22 times more memorable than facts and figures alone. The, our neural act in activity actually increases five times when we're listening for a story. So we've developed, we've literally evolved for stories. There's research to show that we developed our language more around gossip, around stories, than we did about alerting people of danger. This is built into us. And storytelling lights up that sensory cortex in our brain that allows the, the listener to actually feel and hear and taste and maybe even smell the story. So we want to connect with partners and prospects in an emotional way. We want them to feel our story and to become part of it. That there's that quote from Maya Angelou that says, um, I've learned that people will forget what you said. They'll forget what you did, but they'll ne you know, never forget how you made them feel. Stories make people feel something. And that's why they're such a useful tool in telling our brand stories. And I'm convinced that the best brands tell their customers stories. I won't go into these, but the Land of Land Rovers, um, it's a Land Rover ad, although it's almost more of like a documentary piece about this city in Nepal that uses only Land Rovers. They trust them. They're the things that get them around in this mountain community. Um, Squarespace does a good job of this. I listen to a lot of podcasts and usually when they tell a story, it's a customer's story. In this case, Alt Rock, this guy builds Terrazzo. Um, it's his story. And then the fact that he uses Squarespace is just a footnote. Here, the customers are the protagonist in the story. Because our customer stories, they are our stories. If we can make them the protagonist, frame them to be the hero, then they want to be part of what we're doing. We want them to picture themselves in our story. So we're going to talk a bit about the fundamentals of story. We're going to pick out these six elements, um, setting, characters, plot, conflict, theme, and story arc. And then we're going to tie them a bit to brand storytelling. So a setting. Um, easy. You all know what a setting is. It's the time and location in which your story takes place. So they can be really specific or more broad and descriptive. Like a really specific one, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, 1991 to 1998. What story is that? I know you all know. Um, what about a tired cabin in the woods? Nondescript time. That could be any story, right? It's a little less specific. And that's okay too. That that's gives us a feeling already that the setting is a bit of a character itself. Um, sometimes when we're telling our brand stories, the setting might be more of a market or where the transactions are taking place. So for some people, if you're going to be a little broad again, like engaged women, wedding photography, or really specific car dealership marketing managers between the ages of 35 and 55 that live within 20 miles of Atlanta, greater median household income of 150K or more. So when we're telling our story, we might use a market. Um, I don't know how many of you have read the case study up on our website right now. It's about giving tree media. It's actually penned by Vishal, who's on the call. Um, so the market for them might be something like small businesses in New Orleans in need of website design and SEO services with a marketing budget of around $500 a month or more. But if we were going to say setting, um, and both have their place, and it depends where you'd want to use this story, but the setting might be something a little bit more emotional, like New Orleans is a city packed with tourists, though the people that have lived here have lived here for generations. They know how to celebrate and are often decked out 10 days before Fat Tuesday. The food is rich but cheap, and the people are rough but kind, right? So you can see that they're going to bring up different emotions and it depends what your aim is in telling the story that which you might want to use which your aim should always be engaging your audience who is your audience so we want to remember who we're writing for which might mean we need to think of our customers put ourselves in their shoes do a little bit of a role reversal or it's a little graphic of a slide um so you might need to create personas Think of who your customers are, what their needs are, what their day-to-day -day looks like. 
Um, your audience is, is going to be prospects and customers. If you're telling an external facing story, it might be internal. It might be your employees. But when we know that speaking to everyone really just means we're not talking to anyone. We want to use really specific language. And to do that, you can think, whose opinion do I care about? Whose opinion do I care that reads this story? Who's it going to resonate with? Um, this can be broad segments or really specific broad segments or more specific categories. I use this as an example, WestJet's top three brand audiences. Um, it's a Canadian airline. Um, the first one, business travelers, young professionals, um, two vacation goers, families and couples. And third, WestJet employees. So it's not that they don't want to talk to the 65-year-old CEO who's flying for business. They're not alienating him, but they are using language that is going to speak more directly to these people. Because when a client comes to you, it's a statement about them just as much as it is about you. I know this is an old reference, but I always think of the Apple versus PC guy, right? You guys might know these guys. They make the PC guy kind of like frumpy, older guy. And the Apple guy is cool, hip. Um, so I buy Apple products because I think of myself as the creative type. You know, I need a MacBook. I think Mac has less problems, more user-friendly. I think they're a better product. I, I, I. It's very limited of what they have done. So though they've helped me shape the narrative, it's more about how I think of myself that I choose to buy an Apple product than a, over a PC. Next up, characters. So characters what you remember about a story almost always has to do with the characters. They're just vital to the development of the story. The plot revolves around the characters. Central characters are usually a protagonist and an antagonist and sometimes a narrator. So you can't have The Office without Michael Scott or The Last Dance without Michael Jordan. Um, a lot of times where stories tend to fall apart is the characters are two dimensional. They don't mean something to people. So to flesh out a character a little bit, you make people care about what actually happens to them. And that's what we want people to do with our brands, relate to the characters. So that's why we need to define the characters. In that case study example, the main character is the digital agency owner, Matt Ainsworth, the ally, Vendasta, the antagonist or the villain, in his case was COVID, self-doubt, a difficult industry. And the narrator is Vish. He's telling the story. He's leading us through it. He's even asking questions. So character development is important. Um, you can't have 2D characters that people can't relate to, but without a plot, you have no story. Nothing happens to the characters. So plot is, there would just be no drama or no hook without it if everything was character development. The plot drives the story forward. It, it is the story. It's the sequence of events that connects the audience to the protagonist and their ultimate goal. It's just what's happening. Um, I like the example of there's people say you can tell a story in, in sometimes as few as six words. So a log line is a screenplay summary in just one or two sentences. It's hard to get that much story into that, those few of words, but it's often all that writers or producers get to pitch a script. So they really need a good log line. It sums up the entire plot in just a few words. Um, and the objective of a log line is to whet someone's appetite. So you're trying to bait them with the mystery. What happens? How does it happen? You want to sell, not tell. Um, if you tell them too much, they won't have questions. They won't need to read it. You know, sometimes when you read a headline of an article and you're like, yeah, I get it and you don't read the whole article. So a log line might be even the title of a case study or the title of a story sometimes. Um, so this is just for fun. Can you guess the log line of this? Uh, the aging patriarch of an organized crime dynasty transfers control of his clandestine empire to his reluctant son. Oh, Kathy got it, Godfather. What about, now I took out the main character's name of this one. Um, the main character, while not intelligent, has accidentally been present at many historic moments, but his true love eludes him. What's that one? Yeah, Chris T, good job. Forrest Gump, of course. So what's the, the log line for giving true media case study? In this case is actually the title. How Matt overcame fear to make $250,000 annually with Vendasta. That has the problem, the character, and, and the resolution. You don't always have to give the resolution, but it has their objective. Um, the plot always contains the main character's goal, 
or what's their driving force? Like what makes them tick? What makes Matt come to work? Sometimes to look for inspiration for this, you might want to consider their North Star. Um, a North Star, you, you're likely already familiar, but it provides a lens for measuring sustainable growth. It's how a company knows if they're doing well. It's the pulse of a company. And it should always correlate to value delivered to customers. Your North Star shouldn't be a number. If you hit a sales number, that's great for you, but it has no impact on your customers. There's no emotion or there's no story there. So your North Star should be something that provides value to your brand and your customers at the same time. Um, for example, Airbnb's North Star is number of nights booked. Of course, that's good for Airbnb, but it also means who the guest is getting the benefit of experience, experiencing the brand. For Facebook, it's daily active users. And we can debate if that's good for us or not, but uh, presumably we're getting some value out of it if we're logging in. Uber, number of active drivers. It's people who are getting paid by the brand, people who are making a living from it. So your, your story might align with your protagonist's North Star, but it, it might not be their North Star. It should at least align with their objective. Think, what are they trying to do? The plot should be a series of actions that push that vision forward. So what would be Matt's goal from that case study? Um, in case you haven't read it, I'll just, I'll reveal. His main goal was to quit his other jobs, make a healthy living off his media company alone. He was um, doing some tourist, some tours. He was selling photography at a local market and the media thing was sort of on the side. Then COVID hit and he had no choice but to dive in and get, make the, his living full-time from there. And of course, no story is complete without conflict. You can't just have, um, when we think the conflict is what drives the story, it creates that tension and builds suspense, which are the elements that make a story interesting. <clears throat> if there's no on, um, conflict, the audience won't care. There won't be a story to tell. Um, when I think of like when Superman first came out, there was no kryptonite. He was indestructible. He was not vulnerable at all. And audience stopped watching. They wanted him to, they needed someone who could fail, right? They had, there had to be a reason to watch. Um, there's six types of literary conflict. Whatever you choose to pit your characters against, it has a, an effect of how you tell the story. Um, and I won't go through these. It doesn't, they're sort of inherent in human nature, but I think the examples are interesting. So there's person against person, something like Squid Game, person against nature, Jaws, person against themselves, um, a beautiful mind. So uh, Matt might have fit into here or from our case study. Person against society, like The Handmaid's Tale. Person against the supernatural, like Harry Potter. And person against technology, The Matrix. Um, so knowing what it is sometimes helps you frame your story. The brand storytelling parallel of conflict is what is the problem that you solve for customers? That's probably what it's going to come back to. That's probably the, what the conflict is about. So it's related to your why, likely one of the reasons your company started, what problem are you solving? What are you trying to get your customers to do? What are you bringing them closer to? How are you going to help them achieve their goals? Um, Google solves the problem of bad, irrelevant search results. Um, before Tinder, meeting people generally only happened on weekends, not seven days a week. And Nike, they set out to solve the problem of ill-fitting shoes. So it's usually very simple, but something you can rarely say that you've completely achieved. So some Vendasta examples. Our marketplace, we provide relevant products and services to sell. That's the problem we're solving. Marketing services. We can fulfill beyond expectations under a partner's brand. And Vendasta as a place to work provides a fulfilling place to work and pays the bills. So there's different contexts in which your company might solve several problems um, and you choose which one is the target for your story. So for Matt, one of the main conflicts is he couldn't convert his passion for marketing into a full-time occupation. That's the problem he's trying to solve. Then there's theme. So the theme of the story is often what we're actually trying to say. It's that underlying emotion. It's what the story is really about. So some stories have just one theme and then some will have multiple. 
And the theme of the story is woven all the way throughout. It's usually tied to the character's actions, their interactions, their motivations. It's reflected in, in what takes place and in the plot. Um, it usually evokes this universal human experience. Sometimes it can be stated in one word, like love or death, or sometimes it's a little more complicated, but something we all understand, like coming of age. Um, what, what do you think would be the theme for Titanic? cruises. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. I love that even more. Watch out, feel out. Amazing. Love and death. I, I feel the same, Julia. I, I wrote love if I was going to quantify, but there's definitely multiple themes. Tragedy is probably another good one, Brett. What about for Star Wars? Daddy issues. <laughs> oh, that's, that's probably accurate as well. Also, oh, good, good versus evil. <laughs> yeah, good versus evil. That's what I put, Vish. Um, Rocky. Teddy bears they come to life. I said perseverance, underdog, love it, overcoming odds, awesome. So you you get the feeling that there's just this feeling or an emotion that you can feel throughout an entire story. And I'm mainly talking about written story for us creating stories, but it's important to choose the medium. You go, well, does this make the most sense as a written story? Does it make the most sense as a podcast or something audio? Should I get it on video? Um, a lot of times the story will dictate the medium. So one of the main themes in the Giving Tree Media case study is resilience. So Matt had to overcome a lot. He had to try again. He had to fail. He had to build his confidence to become um, resilient. And each story, definitely unique, but most of them follow a traditional story arc, unless you're talking about like Memento or, or some movies where people have really played with how to tell a story. But in general, having a framework makes it easier for us to tell a story that moves people. Um, so a basic story arc, most stories start with this beginning of the story. Then we have some escalating action, something that's leading us to the conflict. Then we have the major conflict. And it's at this point that there's something irreversible that happens. The character is changed or knows something that can't be unknown. And then there's the resolution of the conflict and then tying up the loose ends, the end of the story. So when we recognize the formula, it's easier for us to tell them because sometimes um, a lot of the feedback we get when we run story workshops here is, oh, I just, I don't feel confident in my writing ability. I don't know the story. Um, but sometimes just knowing and filling in the blanks is easier as you get started because you can edit a blank. You can't edit a blank page. So just get something on the paper. Um, so that narrative, we've got the setup. Um, if it's a customer story, what was your customer's life like before your product or service entered, before your company entered the mix? Um, the setup usually ends with the conflict being resolved. So rising tension, that's the series of obstacles that the protagonist has to overcome. In Matt's case, he had to sell some photographs. He had to do art. He had to look for other experiences. And then he had to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? How can I get into the digital marketing world? And then the climax, that's the point of highest tension, the major decisive turning point for the protagonist. That might be um, signing with you or trying your product. It could be something else. It could be a bit of knowledge they gain, um, whatever, but it, that's, that's the climax. And then the resolution. That's how the conflict is solved. What happens? Where is the pregnancy foot finally become, overcomes the conflict or learns to accept it in some cases or is defeated by it? So um, probably not the story you want to tell on your website is like the customers that failed with you, but um, those might be important stories to tell within your organization and to learn from as well. Warby Parker does a good job of laying out their story on their website. And just that first sentence is kind of like their log line. Warby Parker was founded with a rebellious and lofty objective to offer designer eyewear at a revolutionary price while leading the way for socially conscious businesses. It's not perfect. It doesn't hit all the things, but it does allude to the problem and the situation. And then the sentences below flesh out the story. So when you're telling your story, 
What we need to do is apply all that we know about stories to our brand stories and how can we tell our stories more effectively. Um, the parallel of a story arc when we're telling them for a brand might look something like this, like a hook, something that gets people interested. Then you're introducing the problem. What's the customer's life like or what what's happens before? What's the status quo? And then the resolution. How is that problem solved? And then at the end, what do we want people to do? Why did we write this story? What do we want them to feel? Or is there an action we want them to take? Lead them that way. Because we always say a brand doesn't have a story. They have so many stories and you need to tell hyper-specific stories to stay relevant. So think of logging on to Facebook and they'll be like, your friend so-and-so was marked safe during the, the floods in BC. Um, the Leafs, your, your team, your sports team is losing by one goal. Um, so they're really niching that content for exactly who it's for. And those are really relevant stories. As, would you rather drive a Porsche Cayenne or a VW Touring? I'm going to guess a lot of you would say the, the Porsche. Um, they have a lot of the same body. At one point, they were um, building... Uh, Doug, that's a great question, and I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, for the sake of this, for the sake of this slide, they're pretty similar, is what I'm going to say. And one costs about 60k more. Um, so the, it's the importance of a good story. What about a brown egg versus a white egg? It's like, what do you think of brown egg? You might be thinking, some... I'm vegan. You're vegan, <laughs> not for you, Vish. <laughs> Um, but a brown egg might have connotations of feeling organic or, um, or something a little more natural, but they're the same thing. The one just has a chicken with like a different red thing here. Um, a van versus an SUV. I can tell you um, we're vehicle shopping right now and I would rather have an SUV that a lot of the vans are cheaper, have better gas mileage, better safety ratings. Um, but it's the story I'm telling myself about what a van means versus an SUV. And the last example I'll use is Pabst Blue Ribbon. A lot of us drink it here. It's kind of known as the hipster beer of choice, right? It's like a buck a can or something similar. Um, almost the same liquid is repackaged as Blue Ribbon 1844 in China and sells for about $44 a bottle. So the value of story is limitless. So we wanna just create those brand stories to give us value. And it doesn't matter where you are on that value spectrum. Every industry needs a Walmart and every industry needs a Ritz Carlton, right? It's just choosing one and sticking to it um, and messaging out who you are. So the setting, where does the story take place? Our characters, who is it about? Let's flesh them out a little bit. What happens with the plot? Conflict, who or what is the obstacle? Um, the theme, what's it really about? Perseverance, resilience, love, whatever. And then the story arc, let's tell it in a way that makes sense to people as they're piecing together their stories. And always consider who you're writing for. That's what's gonna make it compelling. So sometimes defining these before you start writing, all of a sudden you'll have your story half formatted by going through. Um, so what I want to leave you with today is a couple of resources, a storytelling framework. If you like um, this format, there's a Google link. You can make a copy and use it to tell your own stories. And then the Giving Tree Media case study that we talked about today. Um, some of the resources, but I just want to leave you with your stories are so valuable. And Telling them will move your customers and it can make everyone in your organization care more about that they're driving toward a common goal. So it can just make everyone in your circle of influence care. And that's it. Thanks for tuning in and having me as part of your community today. Thanks so much, Nakia, for coming in and, and sharing how to actually tell a story. I won't lie to anyone. Uh, Nakia actually ran a workshop on stories this past week at Vendasta. And as soon as she was done, I was like, oh, she has to come to our community session and tell it because it was just really powerful. And, you know, uh, she got us all to kind of go through the story framework and kind of map out our own stories, which was really fun to do. But um, enough about me and my experience. Uh, questions? 
who has questions, Nakia is here, unmute yourself or uh, write them in the chat and I'd be happy to voice them for you. Kathy, I, I see a hand. Of course you do, you always do. I see that so, hand. So I, I always find it interesting to hear um, the, the sort of the story arc, right? What we're doing to present to our clients or to um, to do, I, I phrase it, there's only really two ways to elicit a response from someone that's to excite or disturb them. And that's basically what you're saying is to, you know, be, to not be disingenuous, but to also pull at the, either the financial heartstrings, the emotional heartstrings, the passionate, you know, the, the competitive heartstrings. So you're suggesting, sounds like a couple of things to to put our story out there as our business but to also create some sort of case studies that uh, speak directly to whatever it is unique industry groups that we're going for so they then also identify with that type of business 100 percent, great great question kathy um and i did kind of deviate between the two but telling your brand story being of huge importance and what that means. And that might re be retold and changed in the way that you frame things on your website and your social media and each piece having a story. Um, but then I was talking a lot about customer stories, um, in particular case studies being those stories in that people can find themselves within them. So hopefully someone might read Matt's case study and think, oh, I could maybe do a digital agency if I had the right support. I could do this. Yeah, so you're exactly right. I was kind of talking about a couple different tracks there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, thank yeah. you so much for sharing. So I'm actually in the process of that. What I so I was asking myself, what's the missing link? Like, what am I missing from from actually going to production, from actually getting the clients to come to me, right? And so I have multiple stories. So I have my personal brand right? And then I have my product brand and then I have my business brand and they all have three different stories, right? And so I asked myself, how do I actually, which is the most important right now? And so then I was like, yeah, the, the company, nobody knows what the company is. So then it's like focus on the product. And so I created a commercial the other day to focus on the product and I did it for myself. And I was like, who does that talk to? That does not talk to me. That, does, that, that, that doesn't talk to my customers. That talks to me, right? This speaks to me. So you said something very important. You can either have Walmart or you can have, you know, uh, Louis Vuitton or whoever it is, right? Yeah. So my customer at the end of the day is, is people, everyday people. And so I created a commercial and I changed the font based on what would be more intriguing to them right and also based on you know what the way that they think I had to put myself in that aspect and instead of posting professionals I posted pictures of plumbers and, and cooks and food trucks and all that stuff and it made a complete difference and I'm like this is telling the story subliminally of what my brand represents and I was like I wonder if anybody knows but you just hit it so thank you for that yeah that's brilliant, Valentino. And the thank you for bringing that up because that's something, and I still always sometimes forget to revert back to who the audience and I'm telling, I'm just using words that I like or, you know, and, and yes. so always thinking about who that is. One example I think of as, I don't know if you've, any of you have read Seth Godin, um, but I remember like ages ago when I was reading first, I was like, this is really resonating with me. And one thing I noticed is he was using pronouns. He'd say, oh, your marketing director, your CMO, um, she might, and he would just interchange she and he regularly, but it made me like see myself in that position. It's such a subtle change, but you're right. Just the little bits of language or when Obama was against, um, Carrie, he'd be like, I just want to thank him for his decades of service. He's like wanting to say, this guy is old. Everyone, I want everyone to remember that, you know, without saying it, he's speaking to his younger base. So that's such a great point, Valentino. And I think like with the, with the products that you guys have in the back end, I just realized that there was so much more. And so I started looking and you, you guys tell the story of every, every, um, of every vendor. And I was like, wow, the stories are here. There's videos here. There's so much content that I could work with to make sure to put it all together. And that's the part, right? Is putting it all together, rebranding it and putting it out there to the masses. Awesome. Well, thank you for saying that. We always feel like, oh, there's a hundred more things to do and stories to tell, but um, yeah, that's great. Hey, Valentino. 
Is he there? I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I don't know where you are, my friend. But if you ever make it to the Northeast, uh, New Jersey, you need, you need to come on by because I got these fake plants over here. And you seem to have a really big, you know, good green thumb behind you. So if you can come help me out, man, I'd appreciate it. Oh, there, those are all real plants. That's what <laughs> I, I mean. Will, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come plant some for you. <laughs> you Thank you, sir. Thank you. Too. I'm jealous. Everything here is fake, fake plants. I can't have any real ones. I kill them. I forget to water them. <laughs> uh, Cheryl, you have a uh, question in the chat and maybe you want to elaborate. Are there story writing talent at Vendasta? Do you mean like uh, helping you write stories for your business? Yeah. Is there somebody in Vendasta that if I have a, an opportunity, I, I, you know, to bring to bring something forward and I know that we need to write the story, uh, that isn't my forte. I'm, that's, I, I know I'm not going to go be good at that. Is there somebody in Vendesta that we could outsource or bring in and co-source with? So are you kind of thinking um, the story about you and your business and some no. kind of like a case study or like a custom or a case mm -hmm. study for yourself? Yeah, it could be a case study for, for one of my, my clients for sure. But, um, but like, so example, um, you know, I have a prospective client. I can see that their storytelling on their website isn't uh, speaking to their audience. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a plot, the plot and a theme to take them through. And uh, I know that they need that in order for us to run, you know, you know good traffic to the website, either through SEO or pay-per-click. Is there somebody in Vendesta that um, can help us write content? Yes, absolutely. Um, Kathy Paterni, do you want to jump on? You answered it for her or for me, sorry. Sure, absolutely. Cheryl, there is a, a solutions provider right on our platform called the Content Company. Now, they say just under the specific solution that they do blogs, but I've used them to write about us on web pages. I've used them for landing pages. I've used them for introductory stories. I find that they're extremely intuitive. It does take a little work on your part to provide them some of the information. But if you can put a bunch of content, you know, just bullet points together, I can tell you they will write really far superior copy and it's extremely reasonably priced. Good, great, thank you. I see, them. I see them there now, good. Wonderful. Uh, we have time for uh, a couple more questions. Um, Eric just says some new content and new story writing for some of the Vendasta email campaigns and blog posts would be great. Uh, some new content and new story writing for some of the Vendasta email campaigns. Uh, do you mean like refreshing our own blogs and our own email content or like templates for yourself? Yeah, some of the templates that are in there for the marketing resources and the, the email can automated email campaigns and the, the blog posts, the sharing content, things like that. Mm -hmm. Be a good, great place to, to showcase some of the some of the content that some of the, the writers you can create and good to help Vendesta customers mm -hmm. to sell more. Mm -hmm. Were you thinking maybe even like um white label case studies that you could take and put your own brand on it about the like business app and that sort of thing and stories that way yeah white light white label content's always great even okay. even small things like social media posts oh. or just just quick blurps and okay. yeah website content yeah any yeah, kind like of that amazing stories one like the, about the comic book guy like if there was something like that that was like white label yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. the amazing stories one. I don't think it mentions Vendasta. It's just a case study about an agency and the way they found success through e-commerce. Yes. Yes. Case yeah. studies are great. Okay. Okay. Um, Tim, if you don't mind, uh, you just sent me a message. Um, the time for this session. Uh, so what happens with daylight savings? Um, we actually don't change. So now it would be 1130 Eastern Standard Time. So we go from Mountain Time to Central Standard Time, which is very confusing for the first week and a half when Daylight Savings Time happens because it's a nightmare for all of us. Um, so yes, they now are at our, uh, 1130 Eastern Time. 
So my my sincere apologies if if anyone's been um, getting a little confused. And and Brett, do you want to talk about uh, the water cooler Wednesdays? Because I think there's been some confusion about that as well. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. Kudos to you for recognizing that we didn't change and coming in an hour earlier across some deliberate uh, deliberation um, in the executive's decision to just accommodate to your schedules. Um, we're going to honor that 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, point for the Water Cooler Wednesday sessions. So we're going to be starting at uh, 2 p.m. here in Saskatoon. Yeah, Donald, sorry about that. So yeah, keep joining in at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Water Cooler Wednesdays. We're not going to change that. Awesome. Awesome. Right. Um, any last, uh, I can maybe squeeze in one or two more questions for Nakia. I do have uh, just two things to go over uh, before we say goodbye today. Can you just send the link for the water cooler Wednesday? I, can't, I never remember. And then I, I realized guess. it at like four o'clock. Yeah, absolutely. I think Brett I will probably beat me to it. Yep. I have a little bit of a comment on uh, storytelling and things like that. I always do. I, I tend to group group things into uh, the, my my outbound contact into categories like the mortgage, automobile, RV type of industries, and I do research on where they're at at the moment. Not not just the uh, the client, but knowing the client size and who you're speaking to on every call, so that when you're putting things into context for them, it makes more sense. And then the industry as a whole. You know, like the chip thing with the cars that we, I mentioned that almost on every call that I talk to them about. Uh, and then the last comment on uh, daylight savings time. If you look over my shoulder, if, if you get, if you can still see it, if you look over my shoulder to my right, the palm trees that are up at the right hand corner of my, uh, my picture, my background. Yeah. That's actually Arizona and I'm in Nevada. So if you want to talk about getting confused, <laughs> if I go to the store five minutes away, it's an hour later. And every time I make an appointment for somebody, I always have to say, is that Arizona time or Nevada time? Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> it is It is not a lot. And I can tell you the number of times between now and when they change the time back that I will be making that same mistake over <laughs> and over and over again. I've been here for 22 years. Still haven't got used to it. Oh, man. Me too, mm -hmm. my friend. Me too. Um, okay, so uh, Brett shared the water cooler Wednesday. Um, so I just wanted to show you again that this is our Conquer Local Academy. Um, some newcomers on the call today. So I just wanted to highlight again, it's academy.conquerlocal.com and you can sign in through your Vendastic credentials. You also can navigate it from the Vendasta platform. So again, we just have our courses all listed down, be he down here. And you know what, I'll even showcase my not naughtiness that I haven't even earned all my badges. So you can see your badges here, earn them. It, I feel like it makes me more motivated to keep learning because I haven't earned them all. Um, next is our community. So this is where we get to ask questions. A lot of you ask questions and you get to answer each other, which I just love seeing. You guys are amazing. And then here is our new events tab. So this is where you can see the community session login. Um, that needs to be changed to 1130 right there. I just caught it. Um, and then this is somewhere where you can go and find connect. And then it'll take you to our connect page and I'll give you um, a little bit more information. And then the, the presentations from uh, the June event um, and the speakers. So really excited about it. Uh, please, if you have any questions, I will add my email to the chat right now and shoot me an email or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or uh, through the community. So, yes. Does anyone have any else to share before we wrap up today? I have something real quick. I was Isaac, just, yeah, what do you I got? Pulling it up. Um, I'm not quite there yet. Um, if you, I'm wondering who I should contact. I've gone through it multiple different times and no matter what, it never marks as complete. It's the... Mm. It's a course that's not completing for you. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we've, we've been uh, dealing with this issue over the past couple of weeks. We're getting super close. We thought we had it. Um, can you send me your email, Isaac? And then we'll complete it for you on the back end here. Um, for the rest of you, don't use this as the opportunity to say you completed courses. And then we're just going to complete it for you. <laughs> but yeah, Isaac, uh, shoot me your email quick. 
and then I'll, I'll send that or send it to okay. right here it, too. It looks like you actually fixed the problem. <laughs> oh, look at that. Okay, it was good. Mystify search engine optimization. I've gone through that one like 10 times and I'm like, okay. You <laughs> are that, a wizard then. That's actually a tactic on our end to make sure you we really cement the knowledge into your brain. So you're welcome. Uh, okay, this was great. Thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you, Nakia, for joining us today and your first community session. You all are wonderful human beings, and I can't wait to talk to you in the community this week, or I will see you next Friday. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, for we're those south having, of the border, happy Thanksgiving. We're, we're not having a community session next week. We are not having a community session next week. It is Thanksgiving in the U.S. Uh, enjoy your time with your family. Um, eat too much turkey for me. Canada, we've already had our Thanksgiving, so there will be no community session next week. We will send a reminder in the email as well. Okay, that's all I had. Now, everyone, have a great day. Go crush it. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye, all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.